before I get started talking about the events that are going on with the Pope that he's putting into place, I want to read this scripture from 2 Corinthians 11.4. It says in the King James, For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which we have not received, or another gospel, which you have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. And then there's the scripture in Galatians chapter 1, starting in verse 6, that says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Messiah unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Messiah or Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received. Let him be accursed. So now there's things happening with the Pope that have been in the news, but lately it's been bombarded with something else having to do with the Eucharist. And this is going to be um, some commentary that I'm going to talk about and some of the articles that were recently posted in the Washington Post. And uh, the first article is from the Washington Post. And it says, The Vatican tightens rules on supernatural claims in the digital age. And I think that I now understand why he did this first before this other thing with the Eucharist is coming down the pike. But let's see here. It says, the new guidelines reflect a desire to root out fraudsters and flights of fancy and to address how Catholics should view the mystical side of their faith. And this was written on May 17th, 2024. And it says, Rome. When is a weeping statue of the Virgin Mary truly a weeping statue of the Virgin Mary? From now on, for the Roman Catholic Church, only the Vatican decides. And such events will very rarely, if ever, be declared supernatural. With the backing of Pope Francis, the Vatican on Friday issued sweeping new guidelines on unexplained religious phenomena. The guidelines, the first since 1978, reflect a desire to root out fraudsters and flights of fancy and to address how 1.4 billion Catholics should view the mystical side of their faith in a digital age supercharged by artificial intelligence. The Church rejects false mysticism, Cardinal Victor Manuel Fernandez, head of the Vatican's powerful Dicastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, which issued the new guidelines, told reporters on Friday, Some supernatural events have obtained the status of high Catholic lore, such as the 1858 supposed sighting of Mary in Lourdes, France, by the 14-year-old who would become Saint Bernadette. In 1917, the prophecy of three shepherd children who said the Virgin Mary appeared to them at Fatima, Portugal, led to the miracle of the sun, S-U-N, when those gathered reported the celestial body dancing in the sky. Both cities remained sacred and highly lucrative pilgrimage sites for millions of Catholics. Well, there you go. <laughs> it's lucrative. Previously, rulings on the validity of such sightings were the purview of bishops and could take decades for final determinations. But with today's technology, wild claims of mystical experiences are spreading faster and further than ever before. I think they figured out how the internet revolution has reshaped Catholicism, says Massimo Fagioli, a Catholic theologian at Villanova University. Um... It used to be that someone would say, I saw the Madonna, and then the local newspaper would drop by, and then the national one, and then maybe an international one. Now anyone who has a mobile phone and is savvy enough can cause a sensation. The Vatican on Friday said that the bishops had too often bought into false claims. Bingo! <laughs> 
Other times, confusion reigned because a prelate's successor might contradict a previous ruling, leaving the faithful guessing. Now those determinations will be left to the Vatican's Department of Doctrine. Listen, formerly known as the Office of the Inquisition. The Vatican's Department of Doctrine, formerly known as the Office of the Inquisition. And we know the horrors of the Inquisition. And the faithful will not be compelled to believe in such claims. So, they're going to take control over what people can determine is from God or not from God. Not that these things were from God, because I sure don't believe that any of these apparitions are real. Everyone is free to believe in this or not, Fernandez said. In fact, the Vatican said it will largely do away with definitive declarations of such events as officially supernatural, although in exceptional cases a sitting pope may still make such a declaration. Early in his papacy, Francis, who hails from Latin America, where a more mystical form of Catholic worship thrives in some quarters, was seen to embrace the esoteric side of the church, including exorcisms and the power of saintly relics. But he has also expressed deep skepticism at some apparition claims. In 2017, for instance, he cast doubt on the Medjugorje apparitions or claims by six young Bosnians to have seen the Virgin Mary. I would rather believe in the Mother Madonna and not the Madonna who is head of a telegraph office and sending daily messages, the Pope said then. False claims can also fan divisions, and in one Italian town, 30 miles northwest of Rome, a claim of apparitions of the Virgin Mary were recently declared non-supernatural by a local bishop, but not before crowds of worshipers drawn to the spot insisted they were channeling divine messages against same-sex marriage and abortion. New guidelines were long overdue, uh, a professor of religious studies at the College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. Claims of the supernatural are increasingly common, he said. Every Catholic prayer group seems to have a visionary who talks to Mary. He added that making a claim of a supernatural revelation can be a powerful way of challenging church authority in a covert way. So if the Lord decided to give revelations to someone, <laughs> uh, yours truly, um, only the Pope can determine if it's supernatural. Naomi DeAnda, an associate professor of religion at the University of Dayton, a Catholic school, said she sees the new guidelines as motivated by trying to both protect people from supernatural scams and keep them focused on church teaching, only if it's the Roman church. The Catholic Church wants to guard against people raising these events. Mary appears on a tree and then suddenly people come every day or every month and people think that's the way to salvation, she said. There's only one way to salvation and that is through the blood of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. There are groups who take these phenomena and make them greater than the teachings of the church and then the spreading of the gospel message and it becomes a schism. Almost all cases will now be assigned into six new categories offering varying degrees of guidance to the faithful. So, interesting, six new categories. What about the number six? <laughs> the most accepted phenomenon will be labeled as Nahil Obstet, which in which a bishop will be encouraged to appreciate the pastoral value of a vision and will be permitted to promote it, but without expressing certainty about its supernatural authenticity. The most discounted will be categorized as declariato de non supernaturalitate, and the bishops will be told to publicly declare the claim phenomenon as not supernatural. Michael O'Neill, a miracle researcher who appears on the Catholic News Channel, EWTN, 
said only a handful of alleged visions in the 20th century received the approval of a local bishop. Although the new streamlining could suggest a lack of confidence in local dioceses, many church scholars suggested that bishops may appreciate being relieved of having to make the contentious determination of whether something is truly supernatural. I expect bishops will welcome these new guidelines because having a supernatural apparition in their diocese is always something that can cause problems, Schmaltz said. But I also expect that many Catholics will ignore them since the desire to experience or claim the miraculous is so strong. Well, here's the thing. If it doesn't line up with scripture, then it's a lie. And... There is absolutely nothing in the New Testament, the Bible at all, saying that Mary is going to appear to anyone. That's just false. It's not biblical, and if it doesn't line up with Scripture, you know it's a lie. You know that this is a different Jesus. This is a different situation that they're trying to act like all these miracles happen. Okay, so... Now, the next thing I wanted to share, and the reason I'm telling you that this is what the Pope just did, is because they're going to be touring around with this Jesus Thirsts, the miracle of the Eucharist, and it's a film. And it says, deep within each human soul, there exists an intense craving for connection, purpose, and love. A thirst that only God can satisfy. Yet the question remains, how does one fulfill this yearning? The Catholic Church teaches that the Eucharist is the most profound means by which God shares himself with humanity. However, a 2019 Pew Research Study unveiled a concerning reality. Only one-third of practicing U.S. Catholics believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. In Jesus' Thirst, the miracle of the Eucharist film, we embark on a global journey to rediscover and revive the transformative power of the Eucharist. So it sounds to me like he put that other thing in place by the former body of the Inquisition because they're going to revive it with another name that I gave you. And they're gonna bring this global Eucharist thing to the world. Engaging in dialogue with notable Catholic figures, the film explores the biblical origins of the Eucharist and shares personal stories of individuals whose lives have been transformed by the blessed sacrament. The, this exploration makes it unmistakably clear that the Eucharist is not merely a symbol, which is what Protestants believe, but is indeed Jesus Christ himself, fervently desiring to quench our spiritual thirst with his boundless love. Jesus' thirst is a compelling cinematic teaching about the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. It offers a a cathetical teaching which then is reinforced by Eucharist witness of people and events. After watching, a viewer cannot walk away without believing in the true presence. Um, so they have a trailer that you can watch. And this thing is titled, this film is Jesus Thirst, the Miracle of the Eucharist. So they're going to be bringing this to theaters for three specific days. And let me say something about the Eucharist before I continue. Okay, so what do you have with the Eucharist that they're going to spread worldwide and globally? You've got the Pope or Cardinal or whatever lifting up a round wafer that's put into a sun disc, like the worship of the sun, get it? Son of God, but that isn't the son of God. And they put the wafer, this round thing, and they lift it up to the sky. And when they bring it down, they think they actually bring down Jesus from heaven. And then, miraculously, and in some cases they've shown this miracle happened to where the wafer literally turns into a chunk of flesh 
And so they're to partake of this chunk of flesh. And then the cup is turned into the real blood of Jesus. And then they drink that as though they are actually cannibalizing. And they lay this wafer on the altar as if crucifying Jesus all over again. And then they partake of this communion that is supposed to be eating a chunk of his flesh and drinking his real blood. And we know this is absolutely not what Jesus did at the Jewish Passover Seder. And that's where they're going wrong because they're leaving out the Jewishness of Jesus and everything that he did that had to do with the Jewish uh, feast days, which are actually the appointed times of the Lord, the Moed. And the Passover Seder is matzah. It's a, it can either be round or it can be square, but it has no leaven in it. And the Lord broke it. He made everything cleft. And this was a sign of his work at the Red Sea. So he broke the matzah and said, take and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. He didn't hand them a chunk of his flesh and he didn't hand them a cup of his blood. He said he took the matzah at the Jewish Passover Seder and said, when you do this, do this in remembrance of me in remembrance. And then when he took the cup, it's significant that it was in the Passover Seder, the cup of redemption, that he made the covenant with his bride with. And it did not turn into his blood, but it was symbolic, which is the opposite of what they're saying. So they have another gospel, another Jesus, and it says, whoever brings you that, let them be accursed. So they're going to try to pawn off this other version of the gospel, this other Jesus. And the Lord would never tell us to actually consume the flesh of another human being. So it's a symbolic gesture. And the reason why is because he was the bread of affliction, which is the unleavened matzah. And Jesus was put in the grave, Yeshua, on the feast of unleavened bread. He died at Passover, was in the grave at the feast of unleavened bread, which is the matzah of the Jewish Seder. Then he was resurrected on Nisan 17, at the Feast of First Fruits, because he was restoring us to being able to come back into the Garden of Eden and dwell in his divine presence forever. So I believe that the Department of the Inquisition, which now has a new acceptable name, is being put in place because they're going to bring this globally and now that I've explained that, and, and we know that the matzah has the stripes and the piercings, which represent the Messiah's pierced flesh and, um, you know, the stripes by his stripes, we are healed. Okay, so the National Catholic Register then writes a note from the publisher it's important to remember that the National Eucharist event isn't just an event. It's a call to action by the Inquisition group. The last time a National Eucharist Congress was held in the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt was president. Japan was still fine-tuning its secret plans for a surprise attack on Pearl Harbor and Joe uh, DiMaggio was in the middle of his 56 game hitting streak. So the fact that there is one happening this July 17th through 21st in Indianapolis is a very big deal. It will be the 10th such event in our history. The 9th took place in Minneapolis, St. Paul, June 23rd through 26th of 1941. 
six months before the U.S. entered World War II. The turnout was impressive. 75,000 well-dressed men carrying candles attended a midnight mass. Now, you can look up um, on YouTube and you can see the blasphemy that's in the mass, and I won't go into that part, but there are 13,000 voices in the youth choir for a special pontifical mass for children. After the Congress's concluding mass, an estimated 80,000 people proceeded out of the state fairgrounds with the Blessed Sacrament. Another 100,000 or more people lined the two-mile route in reverent silence. A lot has happened to reshape our society in the nearly 83 years since the last National Eucharist Congress, including multiple wars, the election and assassination of the country's first Catholic president, the civil rights movement, landing a man on the moon, I guess they're talking about JFK, and the sexual revolution as well as Roe versus Wade, the clergy abuse crisis and the creation of the internet and the C-19 pandemic. One thing that hasn't changed is the Holy Eucharist. The real presence of our Lord's body and blood remains with us. So they really believe that they can bring Jesus down from heaven, that they have that power. Jesus Christ's sublime gift to us, the Eucharist, remains the source and summit of the Christian life and only of the Roman Catholic Church, I should say. And it still inspires us to do great and difficult things. And this is why it's kind of like you need to pay attention when you see a pastor that's trying to drag you into cavorting with the Pope and his minions. Okay, unlike the National Eucharist Congress that will take place at its conclusion, the pilgrimage has never been done before. The scale and audacity of it. Four separate routes, more than 6,500 miles in all, converging on Indianapolis from east to west, north to south, would impress even our more rugged Catholic forebears. Only a hearty handful of perpetual pilgrims have pledged to walk the entirety of their respective routes, but untold thousands will join in for at least part of it. The scope of this undertaking will be breathtaking. Pilgrims will march across the Golden Gate and Brooklyn Bridges and boat across the Ohio and Sacramento Rivers. They'll gather for Mass in historic cathedrals in many of America's greatest cities, as well as in humble parishes and farms and fields in America's heartland. They'll roll up their sleeves and serve Christ in the poor in the places like the Bronx, New York, North Platte, Nebraska. They'll process with Jesus by candlelight and keep watch with him during all night adoration vigils in Iowa, Texas, and Missouri. You can be sure that Mother Angelica's nuns in Hantsville, Alabama are counting the hours until pilgrims on the southern Juan Diego route arrive at the Shrine of the Most Blessed Sacrament on June 20th. For those who participate, I urge you to do so. It promises to be an unforgettable experience, but it, it's important to remember that this isn't just an event. It is a call to action. The National Eucharist Pilgrimage is our Emmaus moment. Well, they don't have any idea what they're talking about. Because the Lord showed me what you wrote in my book, what he showed them on the road to Emmaus. And it is none of this. None of this whatsoever. So, and I am humbly saying that because I was astonished and everything was provable with the scriptures over and over and over. And he revealed himself. He has hidden secrets in the word of God that he allows people to see. And then they have it in big letters that this isn't just an event, it's a call to action. And then they're holding up the wafer that's round. Inside the sun disk is the picture that they show. Now, a little bit more about this event is Consecrate America, the first ever Eucharist consecration. America is divided. 50 million Catholics have left the church, and the world has run out of solutions, but God hasn't. It says, sign the petition today, and together let's unleash 
Eucharist glory across America. Sign the historic petition. And it says, the first ever Eucharist consecration. One dream. We dream of consecrating America to Jesus in the Eucharist. And as I said, this is a different Jesus. We dream of consecrating America to Jesus in the Eucharist, one person at a time, one marriage at a time, one family at a time, one neighborhood at a time, one parish at a time, one diocese at a time, one country at a time, one country at a time. Imagine America consecrated to the Eucharist. Join us in this dream, and together we can do something bold for God. Enter your email and sign the petition. The world is in crisis. The church is in crisis. America is in crisis. Our culture is more divided than at any time since the Civil War. Rates of depression and anxiety are at their highest ever. Mass attendance is at an all-time low. 70% of Catholics don't believe Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist. 70% got it right. More than 50 million Catholics in the United States have stopped practicing their faith in the past 30 years. 50 million. Behind each of these vast numbers is a human being and a soul, a family, and often a marriage. How do we turn the tide and forge a better future for the Catholic Church in America? The key to answering that question is one piece of data that is more significant than all the data we've reflected upon collectively so far. Those who believe don't leave. Believe what? Believe that Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist. So they're saying that when he holds up the wafer, then he, he is able to bring down Jesus from heaven and he's truly present. And then... They lay that wafer on the altar, and it's like they're crucifying him all over again. It's easy to be critical and even easier to become overwhelmed by the challenges we face, but we all have some responsibility here, and we all have a role to play in renewing the church in our country at this time. To reflect upon our role and responsibility, take a moment to consider this question. There are 72 million Catholics in America. What kind of impact would be possible if we were all united behind one dream? The world has many problems. The church has many problems. America has many problems. Many people believe that they are powerless to make a difference, but here's the truth. You do have the power to create change. You have the power to help consecrate America to the Eucharist. By signing this petition, you're asking the bishops of the United States to consecrate our country to the single greatest source of grace in the world, Jesus in the Eucharist. This Eucharist consecration will make all the difference. What is consecration? Consecration is to devote yourself to God and make yourself 100% available to carry out his will on this earth. It is an act of unconditional surrender to God through the act of consecration. We dedicate ourselves abundantly, wholeheartedly, and completely to the will of God. Surrender our distractions and selfishness and promise to faithfully respond to God's grace in our lives. In the book of Exodus, after the incident with the golden calf, Moses realized that the people had lost their way, and so he called them together and said, Consecrate yourselves today to the Lord that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. In the first book of Chronicles, after God chose Solomon to lead, David gave everything he had over to God and the people of Israel. And then he asked, Who else among you will contribute generously and consecrate themselves to the Lord this day? That's First Chronicles 29.5. And in the book of Joshua, God's chosen people entered the promised land after wandering in the desert for 40 years. And Joshua asked the priest to carry the Ark of the Covenant before the people and said, Consecrate yourselves to the Lord for tomorrow. He will do wonders among you. In Joshua 3.5. For the Jewish people, the Ark of the Covenant was God's dwelling place on earth and God's presence among them. The Eucharist is God dwelling among us. No, it isn't. Because he's physically going to come, which is why he told you when he was ascended up in the cloud that he was the, uh, you know, the two men that were clothed in shining garments said that 
The same Jesus will come in the same manner as you have seen him go. So he's not coming down through the lifting up of a wafer. He's coming down in the glory cloud with the sound of a trumpet with his voice shouting, and so today I say to you with Moses, David, and Joshua, consecrate yourselves today to the Lord that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. Who else among you will contribute generously and consecrate themselves to the Lord this day? We believe it is time we consecrated ourselves to Jesus in the Eucharist. It's time for a Eucharist consecration. Sign the petition to have the United States bishops consecrate America to the Eucharist. So... This brings up another scripture, and you know how the rabbis with the Sanhedrin had been saying that they've been meeting with the Messiah, and then they're going to be building a third temple, and then that so-called anointed Messiah is going to sit in the third temple of God, claiming that he is God, because he's a king, and some kings believe that they have the divine right of kings, that God appointed them, and that they're actually sitting... Uh, you know, like King Solomon believed that he was sitting on God's throne. So this king that they appoint in the tribe of Judah will be sitting, literally, they think, on God's throne. So I wanted to mention to you that this scripture that's really important, it's Matthew 24, and it's starting in verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Now listen to this verse, Matthew 24, 23. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Messiah, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false messiahs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert. Go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. Okay, so... Basically, what this is telling you, if they tell you he's in the desert, which is Mount Sinai, go not forth, believe it not. If they tell you he's in the third temple, the secret chambers, believe it not. For as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered. There's going to be a king appointed by the Sanhedrin. They want to become the world's Supreme Court judges, and they want to have a representative of every nation to come there to the Sanhedrin building to be a representative with the Sanhedrin to bring forth the law and um, the curse of the law, which brings forth death, and you'll still be in your sin because no red heifer can ever purify you, only the blood of the Messiah. So this brings me to join up the Pope and King Charles, and this article was, let me see, where is it, the Catholic Network, and it says World Economic Forum CEO, that would be, Klaus, World Economic Forum CEO, says Pope and King Charles share the same ecological vision. This was posted March 15th of 2024. At the World Economic Forum's annual meeting in Davos in 2020, King Charles III, then Prince of Wales, launched the Sustainable Markets Initiative, aiming to promote sustainability within the private sector. And recently, the organization's CEO, Jennifer Jordan Suffi, paid a visit to Rome for meetings with Vatican officials. And she spoke to Vatican News about King Charles's ecological vision and how it overlaps with that of Pope Francis. Isn't that something? We're here in the Vatican, explained Miss Jordan Suffi, because the Pope 
as a very similar vision to His Majesty the King in terms of the climate and biodiversity. She stressed that the documents each leader has produced on the subject of the environment, especially Pope Francis's Laudato Si and King Charles's Terra Carta, are very similarly aligned. Shall I say, imagine my surprise? <laughs> you can laugh now. They aim, she said, to provide guidance on the urgency of action on climate issues, stressing in particular how nature, health, and the economy are fundamentally intertwined. Another similarity between the Pope and the King, Miss Jordan Safey noted, is their commitment to interfaith work. It's just wonderful to be here at the Vatican, she said, and explore how we look at higher purpose in our various missions the urgency of action, okay? So that goes along with forcing the Eucharist, you know, by the, I'm going to call them the Inquisition group. King Charles Jordan Safey noted, has been working on environmental questions for over 50 years. In that time, she said he has seen just how much the world has changed and how incredibly, in, increasingly urgent change has become. This sense of urgency, Jordan Safey stressed, has been intensified by the king's work as head of the Commonwealth, where countries are genuinely on the front lines against climate change. Asked what one thing everyone should know about sustainability, Jordan Safey suggested the need to adopt a default sustainable position in every aspect of our lives. Micromanage. <laughs> Whether you're a child making decisions putting away rubbish or the CEO of a company making sure that your supply chains are sustainable, she said, it's crucial to make decisions that are as green as possible. King Charles released the Terra Carta in 2021, aiming to put sustainability at the heart of the private sector. And of course, he's got this seal of the Terra Carta which he puts this seal on any businesses that comply with his sustainability program, which is interesting because they're all going to receive the mark of the king, the mark of the beast. Humanity has made incredible progress over the past century, he wrote in the preface to the document. Yet, the cost of this progress has caused immense destruction to the planet that sustains us. We simply cannot maintain this course indefinitely. No, but he can drive around in expensive cars and jets and everything else, and the rest of us, you know, we can't even live in a 15-minute city, right? Words that recall the opening lines of Pope Francis's encyclical Laudato Si, quote, Sister Earth now cries out to us. I've heard of Mother Earth, but not Sister Earth. <laughs> because of the harm we have inflicted upon her. We have forgotten that we ourselves are dust of the earth. Our very bodies are made up of her elements. We breathe her air. We receive life and refreshment from her waters. And that's not true. We receive the breath from the Holy Spirit of God who gives us life. And the Holy Spirit moved on the surface of the waters in the beginning because he made them living waters because the Lord is the living water. So that's a crock right there. Um, you know, that's kind of denying that the Holy Spirit's giving us life. It says that we receive life and refreshment from her waters. You know, in a sense, yeah, we do drink water and it quenches our thirst and everything. But Jesus said, let all who thirst come to me. This reminds me of Proverbs 24, starting in verse 21. My son, fear thou the Lord and the King, and meddle not associate not with them that are given to change for their calamity will rise suddenly and who knoweth the ruin of them both climate change and the bible's telling you do not associate or meddle with those that are 
intent upon change. The whole of Proverbs 24 says, Do not envy evil men. Do not be envious of evil men, nor desire to be with them. For their heart devises violence, and their lips talk of troublemaking. Through wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. A wise man is strong. Yes, a man of knowledge increases strength, for by wise counsel you will wage your own war. And in multitude of counselors there is safety. Wisdom is too lofty for a fool. He does not open his mouth in the gate. He who plots to do evil will be called a schemer. The devising of foolishness is sin, and the scoffer is an abomination to men. If you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. Deliver those who are drawn toward death, and hold back those stumbling to the slaughter. And if you say, surely we did not know this, does not he who weighs the hearts consider it? He who keeps your soul, does he not know it? And will he not render to each man according to his deeds? My son, eat honey because it's good, and the honeycomb which is sweet to your taste. So shall the knowledge of wisdom be to your soul. If you have found it, there is a prospect, and your hope will not be cut off. So, you know, the word of God is like sweeter than honey. Do not lie in wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Do not plunder his resting place, for a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and do not let your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and it displease him, and he turn away his wrath from him. Do not fret because of evil doers, nor be envious of the wicked, for there will be no prospect for the evil man. The lamp of the wicked will be put out. My son, fear the Lord and the king. Do not associate with those given to change, climate change, for their calamity will rise suddenly, and who knows the ruin those two can bring. So part of you getting the mark of the king, the mark of the beast, will have to do with your approving of the sustainability of climate change and their calamity is going to come and Jesus is going to come and the true king is going to come down from heaven in the glory clouds on a white horse and destroy the final kingdoms of this earth and any false prophets or any evil um, that's going on. It's all going to come there to Jerusalem with the Sanhedrin, with the ultra-Orthodox, who are anti-Christ, anti-Gospel, anti-Jesus, anti-Yeshua, and they will put those bills through, and then, you know, all of this will come together there, and the Lord will come down in judgment. So there will be a righteous remnant that will believe in the true Jesus, the Jewish Jesus that is presented in the true Gospel. Do not believe another Jesus because if you do and you go along with this, it says that you will be accursed. And don't let that happen. That's all for now. I'm out of space, so I got to go. I'll see you in the next video. Hope this enlightened you and keeps you aware of what's coming down the pike. And that's why he implemented this thing through the former Inquisition. So that, you know, people will not ever leave they don't want them converting to Protestantism. All right, I'll see you later. Shalom for now. Thanks for your support of my channel.